Tour. Lovely to see you all here and um, people greeting and meeting each other again. And nice that you could come on Monday because our, these talks from the New Zealand Centre for Sustainable City are usually on a Wednesday. So it's great that you could make it on Monday. We've got a very um, special um, run sheet today. We have two people speaking. Our first um, visitor, who I've known for about 20 years, <laughs> is David Jacobs. He's the chief scientist at the National Center for Healthy Housing in the US, where he directs the US Collaborating Center for Healthy Housing Research and training for the World <coughs> Health Organization. He's an adjunct associate professor at the University of Illinois at the Chicago School of Public Health. He was a contributing author and much, um, along with Peter Phibbs at the back here, uh, who's an economist, to the uh, recently released WH International Housing and Health Guidelines. He helped launch the Healthy Homes Initiative in the US and has led research relating to childhood lead poisoning prevention, lead exposure assessment and mitigation, healthy housing, asthma, green building design and policy development. And if we have time, there's, he's also an expert in mold. So uh, you might like to ask some questions about that. David is also president of Lincoln Westmoreland Housing in Washington, D.C., a non-profit organization providing low-income housing for over 150 families. And following him, we'll have Neville Pleas, but I'll introduce him there. So can you join with me in welcoming him? All right, uh, thanks, Philippa. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I should send you greetings from the United States. I split my time between Chicago and Washington, D.C. Uh, these days we call D.C. the reality-free zone. Um, <laughs> but I won't go further on that. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, Peter Phibbs and the Henry Halloran Trust in Australia for making my presence here, uh, here possible. So, so let's get it right into it. Um, uh, so this is not really a new idea, and my main theme today is that we can no longer afford to have a separation between the housing world and the health world. Uh, it's, it's costing us too much money, it creates too much suffering, and we need to combine them. So the idea that housing and health is not really a new idea, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Florence Nightingale had this observation well over 100 years ago that housing and the health is one of the most important connections that exist today. Um, so back then, we had something called the sanitation movement. And this is, this is really why we have housing laws in my country at all. It's for public health reasons. Uh, back at the turn of the 1800s and 1900s, we had uh, diseases, cholera, tuberculosis, and typhoid. But it was really, in addition to better medicine, a housing change that uh, enabled us to conquer those diseases. What was it? Something we all take for granted now. Indoor plumbing, right, sanitation movement. But in the intervening years, housing and health kind of went their own separate ways. Uh, health people became more medically oriented, that is, we'll treat you, but only after you get sick and end up in the hospital. And the housing people became sort of more financially oriented, where housing became more seen as an investment and a way to build health. So uh, fast forward to 1960, this is a picture of the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, my hometown in Ohio that back in the 60s caught on fire, not once, not twice, but about 15 times. So the public looked at pictures like this and reacted in fury and basically said, wait a minute, we all drink that water and we all breathe that air. We want something done. And so this is why in my country we passed the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act, because it was perceived to be part of the shared commons. So the question is, is housing part of the shared commons? Uh, this is one definition of, of what the shared commons means. It's everywhere, the air we breathe, the words we speak. But the kicker here for housing, look at the last sentence, it's everything that is not privately or state-owned. Well, housing is mostly privately owned, right? So that means it's not part of the shared commons. And as a result, at least in the US, every jurisdiction has its own housing code. So it's unlike uh, the health system. If you have an appendectomy done, in Seattle or here in Melbourne, I mean, here in, uh, where am I? <laughs> in Wellington, uh, I've been traveling too much. Um, you hope it gets done the same way. But when it comes to housing, it's different uh, with every jurisdiction. So that, it's been fragmented. And the main reason is because of this. Uh, if you're looking at it from a homeowner's perspective and you make an investment in a home, let's say you uh, patch a hole in the roof, 
when it comes time to sell that home, you'll get some of that money back, that some of that investment back, because the people who assign prices to housing know that the house is worth more. You don't have to make that improvement. But when it comes to a health investment, whether it's asthma mitigation, mold mitigation, or lead paint abatement, that sort of thing, the market doesn't really know how to monetize that health investment. And so from a building owner's perspective, you don't get that investment back, and so a health investment in a healthy home doesn't make financial sense. And that's why we're kind of stuck with articulating the cost of making homes uh, uh, healthy. Uh, and if we don't do that, if we keep reacting to the problems, we'll end up paying the higher prices and shifting the burden of unhealthy housing to our medical care sector, which makes no sense. It's more expensive, it causes more pain and suffering, and we can prevent it. So that's sort of the bad news. The good news is that we are charting, uh, starting to see some um, market vehicles, some systems put in place to label homes so that the investments that are needed to improve health and support health are uh, increasingly better recognized by the economic sector. Uh, after all, if you think about it, what better time is there to invest in healthy homes than at a time of sale or lease? Uh, that's when the uh, financing systems kick into place and they become to be treated like any other housing defect. So, fundamentally what healthy homes in this era is basically about reconnecting these two separate worlds. And I think they are fundamentally connected. Uh, just uh, 10 years ago, we suffered a financial crisis in my country. The, 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 uh, indeed, it was global. Um, the housing crisis had a lot to do with that, so it really is part of the shared commons. If, if housing sinks, it takes the rest of the economy with it as well. So there's lots of other folks uh, that you can probably think of who should be involved, but these are are just a few, and in this talk I want to highlight the role of citizens, especially in democratic countries where our policies hopefully flow from the actions of citizens. Um, these are the key principles, uh, nine key principles that have been articulated over the years, that if we do these things, thinking of housing as a system, we will achieve multiple health uh, benefits. So keeping it dry, clean, ventilated, free of pests, uh, uh, safe from injury hazards, and accessible, uh, free of uh, contaminants, uh, properly maintained, and that you see affordability, which is often not thought of as a health aspect, but it really is. In fact, the, the second leading cause of people unable to make their mortgage payments in my country is because they got a high hospital bill. So housing and health are connected. The leading cause is loss of a job, because unlike you, we still have private sector insurance. Anyway, so if you just do one thing, let's say we keep the home dry, what are the health improvements you would think? Well, it turns out moisture is a uh, leading cause of paint failure, so you take care of lead problems. It causes mold, which is related to asthma. It, it also causes structural rot, so we have an injury dimension and, um, and others. So, so just keeping that uh, system view in place is an important aspect of healthy homes. Uh, Philippa mentioned the WHO Healthy Housing Guidelines. I'd encourage you all to take a look, but this is sort of the first time that the World Health Organization has, and it's really hard to get a guideline out of WHO. I think it took eight years, maybe? Five years. Nine years. <laughs> uh, but there are systematic reviews, and it's really about translating the research into practice. Now, at the end of the day, every nation in the world is going to have its own sort of application, and we are looking to implement these guidelines now in a follow-on project. But certainly this is really one of the best summaries of the evidence uh, that's been put out to date. In, uh, in the United States in 2009, the Surgeon General issued a call to action, and that's a big deal in the U.S. That's how we started the whole anti-tobacco stuff in the 1960s. But he basically defined what a healthy home is, meaning it has to be cited that is located, properly designed, built, renovated, and maintained in ways that don't just prevent disease or injury, but that actually support good health, uh, consistent with the, the definition of health that we have in general. Uh, we have also issued, in, uh, I guess it's been four years ago now, the National Healthy Housing Standard. This is a building code. It's written as a code, and it's annotated with scientific studies that show why its provisions <coughs> are backed up by the scientific evidence. Um, we, uh, with WHO several years ago, also estimated what the environmental burden of disease is that's associated with inadequate housing. Uh, we don't have time to go through that in detail today, but the bottom line is it's enormous, right? And so it makes sense to make sure that this burden of disease, instead of just treating it in the hospital, 
is actually prevented in the first place. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about research and advocacy. Um, back in the early 90s, uh, we had a group called the Alliance to End Childhood Lead Poisoning. This was a, a community and parents groups across the United States that banded together to make it clear that we didn't want to see our children continue to be poisoned by lead paint. And, uh, and then a research entity, my group, the National Center for Lead Safe Housing, which eventually became the National Center for Healthy Housing. The idea being to apply the lessons we had learned from the lead paint experience to other housing-related diseases and injuries. After all, it doesn't make sense to uh, send in separate people, one to do mold, one to do asthma, one to do lead paint, another to do structural repairs and the like. So the challenge is to think about a way to integrate all that. So these are just a few of the laws that were put in place to address uh, lead poisoning, uh, starting in 1971 with the original Lead-Based Paint Poisoning Prevention Act. Uh, the blue line is the population blood lead levels. So uh, in the early years, between the 70s and the early 90s, it was mostly a medical approach. It was directed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for the most part. But after that, it became much more housing focused because that was in fact the main source. So the bottom line here is if the nations adopt policies, they have significant health improvements. That's what the blue line shows, right? So it, it works. Um, so I'll tell you a quick story. In, in, um, in around 1998, I was testifying, these are the four people who were, I would suggest, were responsible for launching the US Healthy Homes Initiative. Does this thing have a, okay. So this is Congressman Lewis Stokes uh, from Cleveland, where the river caught on fire, right? Uh, I, was testi I was with HUD, Housing and Urban Development at the time, and I was testifying before him in Congress on appropriations. And he said to me, you're doing a great job on lead, uh, what are you doing about mold? Uh, we think we have 30 infants who died in Cleveland from mold exposure. And I was much younger then, so I gave a stupid answer, which was, Congressman, as you know, we have authority to deal with lead paint, but not mold. And he kind of said, this is the Appropriations Committee, here's $10 million, go do something on mold to figure out what happened to these infants. So we contacted Dr. Dor Dearborn, who was a pediatric pulmonologist. Uh, he did autopsies on the, these infants who died. And they had originally been diagnosed with SIDS, you know, sudden infant death syndrome. And he said, there's lesions in the lungs that are not consistent with SIDS. There's something else going on here. Uh, so, but they didn't know what it was. So this is Terry Allen. He's the health commissioner of the city of Cleveland. And he said, let's go look at the houses. And when they did that, they found that each of these houses where the infants had died had this kind of a, a heating and ventilation system. So basically, this is showing that it used basement air as supply air for the air intake. And then uh, this part of Cleveland had, had been flooded in a recent flood, and there was the so-called black toxic mold, the Stachybotrys atra that you all read about. Um, and the mold spores were being distributed through the house. So there was initially some controversy about whether this is what it was, but the solution was pretty straightforward, right? Create a closed loop ventilation system using either recirculated air or fresh air, dry out the basement and remediate the mold. And that worked. Uh, we have a national safe and healthy housing coalition in the United States. Um, it's it's been around for about 10 years now, and I wanted to use the rest of my time with you today to talk a little bit about that. But basically, uh, uh, it, it includes not really so much international groups, we have a few of them, but mainly uh, regional and coalition members uh, at the national level. Uh, these are a few of them, and basically it's anchored by our group, although there are many other collaborators. Uh, it has 600 individual numbers and counting, 400 organizations, and uh, we are in 49 states. So the main things that we do are to basically educate people. We have a steering committee with policy and, and other work groups around specific measures. And the key thing I wanted to highlight is we do regular Hill visits, meaning Capitol Hill, visits to Congress, um, where people can meet with their members of Congress and basically inform, educate them about why healthy housing matters and why it's so important. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, we also produce these fact sheets, and people seem to like these a lot. But basically, for each state in the nation, we have a two-pager. And it basically says, what's the funding sources in those states that could be used for Healthy Homes Initiative? And this is one from the state of Illinois. So we see we have a lead program from CDC, an asthma program, environmental health tracking network, and HUD's 
uh, various and, and EPA work. And then also note the Department of Energy's weatherization program also has significant health consequences. And I, uh, I neglected to congratulate New Zealand, but I know you've done a lot of work on insulation. Dr. Alvin Chapman in particular has been leading the charge on that. And I think it's a wonderful uh, fact that you now have this warrant of fitness. Even taxi cab drivers, I found, know about this new law. So it's a, it's a major step forward, and I did want to congratulate you. But it's just to say that there are multiple agencies involved. And sometimes it's confusing about which agency is responsible for doing uh, which piece. And then we also, in, on these fact sheets, we highlight specific health conditions in that state and uh, hyperlink it to specific data points. So in Illinois, we know that 31% of children live in households with a high housing cost, 59% have uh, lead paint in their homes, 8% of ad adults have uh, current asthma, 41% of homes tested in Illinois have radon above the EPA action level, and so on. So when you go to a member of Congress, what do they say? They're an inch deep and a mile wide, right, from policymakers. So at most, they're going to read a half a page. We give them two pages. And their staff actually gets it. So uh, why did the coalition start? So this is funding levels for the red bars are for housing and urban development. The blue bars are for the Centers for Disease Control. And the green ones are for EPA. And this is mainly for our lead program. So if you look down here in 2012 and 2013, this is Congress at it doing its worst. They basically wiped out the CDC lead program. In other words, if, and CDC is responsible for, okay, for basically doing surveillance and tracking the number of poison kids. So uh, basically the staffer who did that, and it was one young staffer in one congressman's office, said, we didn't hear from the lead people. We only heard from the asthma people. To which I said, well, CDC should do both, right? We can do asthma and uh, and led at the same time. But anyway, uh, it was because there was no organized effort, we finally clawed our way back so that you now see, surprisingly, that we have record appropriations, not only for CDC, but HUD and EPA as well. Um, so the most recent visit to, uh, to Capitol Hill occurred in February. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I won't go through the details of this, except to highlight that this is the type of people who come to these uh, to these things. This is Paul Hahn. He leads us a, a local community group from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, he brings some moms and, and some, uh, she's a physician actually. This is a congressional staffer. These are the people who actually do the real work behind the scenes that are important to do. And then this is the mayor's uh, legislative aid. So all of these people would converge at one time to meet with members of Congress or their staffs to get, uh, to advocate for healthy homes. So from a, I know some of you are researchers, and I just wanted to highlight this thing from a policy perspective. As researchers, we tend to highlight what, things that we don't know, right? Because that's our next grant proposal. Uh, but from a policymaking perspective, they only are interested in what we really do know. So there's an ongoing challenge in how to bridge this divide to make research policy relevant. Um, and so basically, my take home message on this is, First, we should use the science to quantify how big the problem is, uh, pass legislation, find out solutions, uh, and then document that they really work and have the expected uh, 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 intended consequence, estimate what the costs and benefits are, uh, pass the legislation, and then make sure that what we're doing actually works. Um, but there's obviously a lot more to that. Uh, this is one of our studies we did in Chicago. How do you like that? It's a cool acronym, right? The MIGHTY study. I was going to give my students capes to wear but, as superheroes. But anyway, it stands for Moving into Green Healthy Housing to Yield in Health. And uh, basically, this is a group of three uh, public housing uh, developments where people moved into housing that had been uh, rehabilitated using green standards. And basically, what we found was that there were statistically significant improvements not only in physical self-reported health but also mental health improvements which I think has been sort of uh, inadequately recognized. Also improvements in uh, hay fever, headaches, sinusitis, angina, respiratory allergy, asthma severity, and then uh, these mental health improvements having to do with sadness, nervousness, restlessness, and child behavior. Um, and then there's been a number of these studies that have looked at these green building standards. There's a lot of them out there but it's, uh, it's basically energy driven for the most part, but there is a real health consequence. Uh, this is Jim Krieger's work in Seattle, Mich um, uh, Washington, where he looked at 
uh, Breathe Easy Homes. These are public housing units targeted to children with asthma. And he basically showed that over every two-week period, uh, five days uh, passed without symptoms. Uh, and there was a 41% reduction in trips to the emergency room. And in my country, emergency room visits are really expensive. So this paid for itself. Um, here, I mean, in Australia, we also have a Luke Nibs uh, study that looks at the burden of disease associated with dampness as well as inadequately exhausted gas stoves. And basically, uh, what he showed was that, um, you know, he measured the magnitude of the problem. 28% of Australian homes have dampness problems. 38% have gas stoves. 8% uh, of asthma, he found, is attributable to damp housing. And 12% is re related to these unvented gas stoves. Okay, so I gotta move on. So the conclusion was, we, if we can control damp housing and exhaust from the gas stoves, then we could dramatically reduce asthma burden in Australia. Um, the final, I guess, key point I wanna make regarding um, uh, health effects intervention is that we tend to do research more on health issues uh, and less on the solutions to it. So lead, we have about 28,000 publications on lead poisoning. And yet, out of that, only 33 of those studies are related to actually fixing lead poisoning. So there's been a tremendous imbalance, and I would suggest we need to focus more on intervention research, uh, not just documenting how uh, toxicant can produce one or another health effect. So um, I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. Uh, I did sit on a panel at the National Academy of Sciences that looked at uh, how to integrate health into long-term disaster recovery. In this era of climate change, I suggest that uh, we need to focus more holistically on how we're going to rebuild houses uh, uh, in a way that uh, minimizes future health uh, consequences. There is a specific health recommendation in that document that says if you are going to rebuild, uh, use it, uh, do it using uh, green uh, standards. And HUD actually adopted that as part of their Rehab. So I was in Christchurch on my trek through uh, the South Island, and I know there's a lot of rebuilding going down, on down there. I asked people, well, is there a thought of maybe how it ties into health, but nobody could really answer the question. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, these are the lim we have limitations in both the housing and the health professions. In the housing world, we tend to wait for housing conditions to get so bad that people complain, and then maybe something gets done. And in the medical world, we wait for people to get sick and end up in the hospital. Both of those, I think, are short-sighted. We need to basically uh, uh, find these uh, investments and market failures to make sure that the investments thing. So this is, uh, reconnecting these two worlds is more than a good idea. It's an absolute necessity. Uh, so knowing is not enough. It's not just enough for us to do the research. We have to apply what we know. And we also have to be willing to do something. And we actually have to do it. And so from a policy perspective, getting these policies in place means that we as citizens take action. Um, did, any of, did you have March for Science here? I didn't think I'd be old enough to march down the street chanting, this is your nerd alert. What do you want? What do you want? Peer review. <laughs> but that was a chance. And facts are uh, in short supply these days. So I met this 10-year-old little, little boy. And I know you can't see his sign, but I think he had the right viewpoint. He said, think like a proton. Be positive. Uh, so that's what the Cuyahoga River looked like in 1960. This is what it looks like today. So the point is, if we put our heads together, build the science, get the policies in place, we can have situations like this where we actually improve the conditions and not just uh, allow people to become ill. So again, thanks to the Henry Hallam Trust and to uh, the University of Otago here and uh, Philippa for having me here. <laughs> And it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Associate Professor Neville Pierce, who's the Deputy Director of Hekai Moranga, the Housing and Health Research Program. Actually, I won't read all this. It's <laughs> Basically, he's um, joined us with a heating study, and um, he's done a number of randomised trials. We're up to about six or seven now. And... Um, and he's currently working on the shelter study, which looks at home interventions to prevent rehospitalization of children with respiratory disease. So we, part of the Zeke guys, we, are, we also wanted to stop children getting into hospital. And this is the effort that with, along with community partners, um, um, Cheryl Davies at the Tukatani Māori Asthma Trust, 
um, regional public health, um, a whole lot of people in the hut where you've actually worked to um, do exactly, make that linkage as such as um, Dave recommended. And so Neville's going to take us through that. And there are a number of members from the team here, so great to see you here. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, David, for a great um, call to arms indeed, and a great body of research that you, uh, research in action that you've uh, been produced, uh, that you have produced over a long period of time. And it's really great to see you here in New Zealand yet again, um, a frequent visitor um, <laughs> and a much appreciated visitor indeed to, to our shores. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, what's really the New Zealand um, the New Zealand Call to Arms or the New Zealand program at the moment, um, the New Zealand Healthy Housing Initiatives. Um, uh, I've done a lot of work with um, Maddie, Ellie, uh, Lynn Riggs and Cheryl Davis and a few others and many others in fact. Um, <clears throat> but in particular I'd like to thank and the most important people here are the providers who've actually been doing. So there's um, <clears throat> 11 different providers in 11 different DHBs uh, throughout the country who've been providing and actually going into the homes um, and doing the work. So I wouldn't, this is uh, the research on their work or research around their work. Um, it's not, I, I, haven't, I haven't been into the 15,330 homes they've been into, um, nor do I have the, <laughs> but it's great, that, it's great that we've got together and through the Ministry of Health, uh, Housing New Zealand and our other, and MHUD and our other partners, we've got together and EEC as well. Um, we've got together and we're pushing, we are doing this. Um, so just a little bit about why um, <clears throat> the home, when you're talking about environmental exposures, um, and this is a slide I borrowed from Michael Keel. Um, all, for all age groups in New Zealand, uh, everybody spends most of their time in their home. So if you're thinking about what is your exposure to your environment, your most common environment is your home. Um, this is especially true of young kids that we're focused on at the moment. Um, and if you're a lucky parent, hopefully they will spend most of their time in their own bedroom, um, <laughs> um, which is always to be hoped for anyway. Um, so then I guess this brings us on to what is the standard of New Zealand homes? Um, and this is the Brands House Condition Survey. There's a lot of other work being done around this too. Uh, but basically about half of them are heated, about half of them are mouldy, about half of them are correctly ventilated, uh, less than half of them are properly maintained. Um, we still have, the heating appliances are uh, tragically out of date. Uh, insulations up to spec in less than half of them. <clears throat> so in a word, New Zealand homes are crap on average. They're crap. <laughs> Half of them are broken on about most of the things. The, uh, I know that David had a nice paper from Australia giving out about gas stoves. We still have gas, we have, still have 90,000 gas heat, over 90,000 gas heaters as the main form of heating inside New Zealand homes. Um, <coughs> and that, all of these stats are much worse for renters and they're much worse for people on low incomes. This is exacerbating, and has been for quite a while, exacerbating our inequalities in health. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk, so a little bit before we got going and why this group, we wanted to talk about, I wanted to look at, and we looked at, for children hospitalised with housing sensitive conditions, the Ministry of Health definition, this is, um, this is the time taken to return to hospital. Um, and the black line up the top, just for a contrast, is for all hospitalisations, for any kid in a New Zealand hospital, how quickly do they come back? And you can see the New Zealand health system um, in contrast to the American one, is, uh, <coughs> is single payer and the government pays, but it, it works very well. So 15 years later, a child who's uh, been hospitalised in New Zealand is unlikely to have come back, less than half of them. This is not in any way true for children with housing-related diseases. So if the cause is medical, we're actually doing well and we're making sure that they're not coming back. If the <coughs> cause, unfortunately, is housing or crowding-related, um, they're much more likely to be coming back to hospital far, um, much quicker. Their, their re-hospitalisation risk over 15 years is 86%, and they're coming back at 3.6 times the rate. Um, there's another graph that I won't show you, but th th these children uh, who are vulnerable, they're in low-income housing um, in almost exclusively. Um, and from 2000 to 2014, the children who were coming in for housing-sensitive hospitalisations were dying at 10 times the rate of the children coming in for all-cause hospitalisations. So we have a severe problem 
with children who are being hospitalized for housing causes where not the medical system isn't set up and wasn't addressing their main, um, the main problem, which is housing. Um, this is from our assessors here in Wellington, and it's some of the quotes, just to give you an idea of how bad the standard, and it's still, coming from abroad, um, it still shocks me, some of the, the houses that we've gone into, and the standard that people are living in, um, and children are living in, that it just, um, some of them think it's normal life. They just get used to coughing and being sick all the time. Um, and that's a real, that's a, that's a real disappointment and a real systems failure, if you like. Um, so let's move on to some of the solution. And this is the, this is the, <clears throat> this is the uh, list of interventions supplied by Well Homes, which is the HHI here in Wellington. Um, all of them are different and, and independent. Um, but in particular, insulation, um, mainly provided by ECA, and we've done randomized control trials of that. We've done randomized control trials of heating. We've done, randomized, we've done uh, trials on mold, um, and we've had a, a look at various other things. But actually, this is on minor repairs and injury prevention in particular. But um, this is about, can we do it all together? Do we have to have a separate visit to the house to do the insulation, the heating? Um, we know a separate visit to the house for the insulation is effective and for the heating and for the things, but it makes no practical sense from a delivery point of view. This isn't how, as David mentioned, this isn't how you deliver or should be delivering a housing intervention. Um, this is how can we have a look at the package and what is the effect of a package? Um, to highlight again that it's having that breadth, um, and this is uh, some of Ellie's work, um, that basically it's getting all the bases um, and trying to, be, trying to get health culture together. Uh, in well homes, we work very closely. Um, uh, one of our main assessors is uh, Kokiri Marai, the Sustainability Trust, and uh, Regional Public Health are the three agencies doing the visits, and they're cross-training each other. So that's working really well and gives people a, a bit of a rounding on the, the key things that we need to know. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, working together and an integrated approach are the key things. Um, and uh, somebody to deliver both the interventions and the education at the same time, there is two components to this. Um, uh, I guess informations and, uh, infor interventions and information together. Um, um, and then I guess the challenges that uh, Ellie pointed out and that I will be talked through, um, we have a real, and, and this was done before the Healthy Homes Guarantee Act really came in, was the real challenge here was getting landlords. Um, Housing, New Ze Housing New Zealand or Kayang Aura as they are now, were good at delivering uh, the interventions for the house, but, and where we could deliver the intervention ourselves, it was working really, really well. We were getting 80 to 90% of those in. But we had a real problem where we had to get the landlord to give permission or, to, or more importantly, to pay for anything or to do anything. Um, that's about, we were only getting 30% of those. Um, and it's sometimes a make me attitude. So that's why it's really good and that's why it tees into a policy thing and it's probably essential to have a Healthy Homes Guarantee Act that gives some stick to make me. Actually, yes, we will make you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, um, so then I'm going to, um, what's new here and what I want to talk about um, <coughs> for, for the next, um, we have 20 years of housing research, so I have to pick things carefully. Um, <coughs> so I, I wanted to talk about uh, the interim analysis and how, what are the results of doing this kind of joined up intervention? What are the, the outcomes of doing it in a community-led way, in a fan-centered way, where a wide variety of things together? Um, and this is very much an interim analysis. Um, and it's the first look at it. So for the, this interim analysis, we're, um, we just, we use the encrypted NHIs to look at hospitalizations and pharmaceuticals, and from that we inferred GP visits. So it's quite a narrow health, fo health sector focused look at it, and in phase two we will be, which I'll talk about briefly, we're going far wider. Um, so just to give you the results, because um, it's always good to start in results. For every 10 uh, children, or Tamariki referred to the Healthy Housing Programme over the next year, over the next year alone, one less, child, that one less child was in hospital, six fewer pharmaceuticals were dispensed, and there were six fewer GP visits. 
So if you go, to, if you go across the 15,000 healthy housing interventions that have been done, we're talking about nearly 9,000 fewer prescriptions, over 9,000 fewer GP visits, and 1,500 hospitalizations have been prevented in a year. So one year after those 15,000 kids were seeing. And when you improve the house, there's no reason it only lasts a year. Um, so how do we do this and how do we come to this? We took our uh, 4,000 um, 4, initial people. And then because this is quite tight, we were looking, we got down to a sample size where we could look at before and after of, of 1,608. Um, and, um, but it was quite good and it was a good process getting through and we got a lot of data off the community providers. Um, and the children we're seeing, so this is, um, 40% of our children are aged 2 to 5, they're our biggest age group. 55% uh, are Maori and 36%, 37% are Pacific. Half are living in Housing New Zealand and for, nearly 40% in uh, private rentals. Um, there is nearly a, there's nearly as many owner occupiers as there is homeless people in the cohort. Um, those are the other two groups to make it up. Uh, in Northland, which uh, Maddie kindly prepared the slides for, uh, so for some regions, Maori are even higher, up to 90%. Um, so we're looking, at the, we're looking at the three outcomes that I mentioned just here. Um, and this is what we did. We had a look for the, um, <coughs> the year pre, so 12 months pre. This is the date of the first intervention. Um, this is generally the information and assessment, and sometimes the, quite often they're bringing along some of the thi some th uh, things in the back of the car. The assessors are that they know people need. And then these are you'll have multiple interventions delivered over time, and eventually we stop delivering interventions, uh, or all the interventions are assessed as met, and then we compare. So we're comparing this uh, orange bar with the grey bar, the 12 months before, the 12 months after. Um, so the statistician in me um, always wants to talk about this, so bear with me for a little bit. There's two systematic differences that we have to account for here between this group and this group. Um, age, yep. <coughs> everybody has systematically gotten older, um, so we adjust it out for age. Um, in general, as children get older, on average, they aren't as sick. Uh, fortunately, age is entirely predictable. Um, you can entirely predict at what rate somebody's going to age. Um, so that's quite easy to get out. Um, and then selection bias. So the other thing we need to do is we have, for this group here, we've selected children that were sick and hospitalized as far as uh, preference. So we looked at, um, so what we were looking at here to, to deal with this, we looked at uh, indicator conditions or things that are probably housing related but weren't on the indicator conditions. So we haven't used the most, um, we haven't, we've allowed for selection bias by predicting off uh, hospitalizations that are probably housing related but aren't in the category the Ministry of Health was using to enroll. Um, <clears throat> so then from our sample of 1,608, 1, we have nearly a perfect 10% of the hospitalized, they have 10%, they have 0.1 of a hospitalization less each, that's 160. Um, so that's one, express, moving that up to the population of 15,000 who was done, that's, the HHIs have lightly prevented 15, uh, 1,500 hospitalizations. Uh, for pharmaceutical usage, um, in our sample alone, we could detect a reduction in pharmaceuticals being dispensed of 921, and that equates to 8,800 uh, less pharmaceuticals being dispensed. For the GP visits, 990 and 9,400 less GP visits. And that's just in the year after. Um, so Lynn Riggs and Motu very kindly took our numbers um, and ran through a cost benefit analysis. So does this make financial sense? Is this a good return on investment to be preventing 0.1 of a hospitalization, some GP visit, 0.6 of a GP visit and some pharmaceuticals? Um, so on average, with the cost of the program was um, 1,205, um, and the entire cost is 19.2 million. Um, those are the costs that the Ministry of Health as a system incurred. The Ministry of Health isn't paying for the uh, cost of the interventions. Those are generally fundraised in the local communities, uh, and certainly a gap that we'd look to address. Um, 
So we're looking at it and it, it breaks down from, it's about six million from, ho from less hospitalizations, three million from shorter, less severe hospitalizations, and 800,000 from the GP and pharmaceutical visits. That's about 10 million a year in savings or 30 million over, <coughs> over three years. So this is a huge, this, is, this program pays for itself inside two years, which is really huge. Um, and it's a really good return on investment. So housing, or fixing the housing of the children hospitalized for housing related diseases, funnily enough, helps them um, be hospitalized less than is a good way of preventing them returning to hospital and preventing the burden on the health system. I do want to estimate, I do want to stress that this is quite a narrow look at it and it's the, the first cut. So we're only doing one year, after, we only looked at one year afterwards and that's strictly, a, we only had that much time to look at it. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't, uh, not, all, um, not all benefits are included. Um, averted healthcare costs, we haven't looked at the other people in the house, um, and that's something we're very keen to look at, the other, other household members. We haven't looked outside the health system, and we know from our previous work that sick kids are less likely to go to school, and that if you fix the illness in the house, um, the children will go to school more often. This is entirely obvious to me as an parent, but we do need to prove it. <laughs> um, improvements in well-being and other outcome, outcomes for household members. That if your housing is improved, that you can do and do more. Um, so how we're going to do this, um, just um, this is what we're looking at. The, the two slides were slightly on. Um, so we're looking at them in the, we're now moving the cohort um, into the integrated data infrastructure. So what we want to take is the NHI put, we're, going to, we're linking that to the integrated data infrastructure and then we want to look across health, social support, justice, IRD and education. Have a look at the whole host of outcomes that we're getting off this. Um, because housing is really a holistic intervention. It's probably, there's a probably, there's, it's cost effective on health alone, but actually there's a lot of players. And it's really great to see a lot of the players here, to see um, Ministry for Housing and Urban Development, to see ICA, um, <clears throat> to see MSD, because um, thankfully Wellington is not a reality free zone yet. <laughs> and the evidence does matter, and if you can prove it, hopefully, you can get, hopefully we can get these to continue and expand. Um, once again, I want to uh, thank, uh, most importantly, the people who've actually done the work and the community providers. This is a, a community uh, effort, um, and, it's, um, and it's really cool um, to get everybody involved, and communities care about housing. Um, and this is one of the, the pleasures of going around and talking to, to people about their results and their data and getting it together so as we can prove the case that is probably slightly obvious, but we need to do that implementation of the WHO guidelines and why we need to make sure that every child in New Zealand is living in a healthy home. Okay. Thank you very much.